column-oriented data storage allows us to access all of the entries in a database column quickly and efficiently. Columnar storage formats are mostly relevant today for performing large analytics jobs. For example, if you're a bank and you want to get the sum of all the financial transaction values that took place on your system in the last week, you don't want to iterate through every row in a database of transactions. It's much more efficient to just look at the column for the amount of money and ignore things like timestamp and user ID. You don't want to look at every single aspect of a row. You just want everything in a single column. Julian Ledem co-created Parquet, a file format for storing columnar data on disk. Jacques Nadeau is a VP of Apache Arrow, which is a format for in-memory columnar representation, and they're both part of Dremio. They join the show to talk about how columnar data is stored, how it's processed, and how it's shared between systems like Spark, Hadoop, and Python. This is a topic that is only going to grow in importance in the near future as data engineering becomes a bigger and bigger component of a software company's important stack. And I had a great time talking to these guys, so I hope you enjoy it too. To understand how your application is performing, you need visibility into your database. Vivid Cortex provides database monitoring for MySQL, Postgres, Redis, MongoDB, and Amazon Aurora. Database uptime, efficiency, and performance can all be measured using Vivid Cortex. Don't let your database be a black box. Drill down into the metrics of your database with one second granularity. Database monitoring allows engineering teams to solve problems faster and ship better code. Vivid Cortex uses patented algorithms to analyze and surface relevant insights so users can be proactive and fix performance problems before customers are impacted. If you have a database that you would like to monitor more closely, check out vividcortex.com slash sedaily to learn more. GitHub, DigitalOcean, and Yelp all use Vivid Cortex to understand database performance. At vividcortex.com slash sedaily, you can learn more about how Vivid Cortex works. Thanks to Vivid Cortex for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily, and check it out at vividcortex.com slash sedaily. It's a pleasure to have you on board as a new sponsor. Julian Ledem and Jacques Nadeau are with Dremio. Julian and Jacques, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you, Jeff. Today we're going to talk about the columnar data format, the Apache ecosystem, how these things are evolving. Let's start off by describing the columnar format and how it differs from other formats, why this is an important topic. Julian, could you start us off with that? So traditionally, data processing started with raw-oriented, and it's just more um, natural way of treating data. Uh, but as the uh, processors have evolved and uh, become more uh, sophisticated, um, columnar-oriented representation is a much more efficient way of uh, representing the data for processing. And this is because of multiple optimizations that uh, processors um, are doing under the hood. And so in contrast to the row-oriented uh, setup, like if you think of a row, it's maybe got, you know, a row for a user maybe has user ID and um, user name and user purchase ID or something like that. But if you're looking at the columnar format, you're looking at an entire column in a database. So you might only be looking at all of the entries of user ID, but nothing else. Is that accurate? So the, the natural way of the raw entity, like you were saying, so if you have three columns and there are different types, like maybe a string, uh, an integer, a date, um, then when you represent it, you're going to interleave uh, data of different types. And uh, it has different drawbacks on how you can uh, efficiently process that. When when you do a columnar representation, uh, so the way we visualize data is two-dimensional. We, we visualize rows and columns. But when we represent it in memory on disk, then we have to uh, split it into um, a linear representation. So user 
uh, write one row at a time or one column at a time. So in the row oriented, it's interleaved and uh, you have one, you know, you interleave data of different types, one row at a time. But in columnar, you put all the values for a given row at, at a time together. Um, and the advantage of this is that first, um, yeah, you'll be encoding data of the same type. So you do, can do several optimization uh, related to that. So in Parquet, for example, uh, when you encode multiple integers together, um, you can use tricks like um, run length encoding or bit packing because you're encoding things of the same type and you can encode them together in more efficient format. And uh, yeah. So so before we get into the specific systems like Parquet and Arrow, let's talk about the broader ecosystem a, a little bit more. Um, so there's, there's this problem in the open source big data ecosystem where you have all these tools. You have like Spark, Hadoop, Cassandra, uh, all these different systems. And they need to share data with each other. So how does data sharing typically work among these systems? Or how has it worked in the past? So I, I can use one example of um, that currently has been um, a problem or is not working as efficiently as it could. Um, like in data science, uh, Python has been one of the popular tools um, for analyzing data. And you have tools uh, like NumPy and uh, uh, pandas uh, to do a, a fast uh, in-memory processing in Python. And uh, people are very happy with it. And it works well as long as the data fits in memory on one machine. And then um, like a popular way of uh, working on bigger data and splitting it on multiple machines is to use Python with PySpark. And in this use case, um, then you, you always have like a, a drop in performance due to um, a distributed processing because you have the overhead of communicating from node to node in a distributed fashion and um, joining parallel results together. But you get also the extra overhead of serialization, deserialization uh, over the wire. And so what one, and one of the problem is um, like Spark runs on the JVM and it's a Java-based uh, process. When um, uh, when Python is a native code uh, running in separate processes, and so they come from two different uh, ecosystems, and the serialization deserialization of objects on the wire um, end up being a very inefficient mechanism to communicate. So the the main goal with Arrow is to have this common representation that will remove entirely. Um, the serialization deserialization cost because the in memory representation becomes a working format. And so we can use tricks like shared memory and make all that interaction much more efficient. So we're talking about this, this difficulty in data sharing. We're also talking about this, uh, this columnar data format. Uh, what's the connection between these two issues? Like, help help me understand um, why we need to uh, frame the 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 problem before we get d deeply into Arrow and um, and Parquet. W um, help me frame the problem a little bit better, where we're talking about both the the issue of data sharing and the issue of the columnar data format. Yes. So. Um... So those, those two problems are a little bit interleaved. Um, so Arrow is interesting because it's both an efficient representation for data processing and a standard. Uh, because um, if you have only uh, an efficient format, but if you actually use two different efficient formats uh, between two systems, then the interaction of the two will have to translate from one to the other. And that's where you get um, serialization, deserialization cost. Uh, if you use uh, a common format between things, but it's not a format that is efficient for your internal representation, then you still need to translate between the communication format and your internal representation. So the, the goal of Arrow here um, is to be both an efficient uh, internal representation for data processing and we'll go later, I guess, in the details of um, why columnar is more efficient. And, but yeah, so also efficient uh, 
and the standard representation so that it can be uh, copied from one system to the other without any kind of translation. The performance bottleneck that you get without a system like Arrow or a system like Parquet is you have serialization and deserialization because you have to serialize it into a generally readable format uh, and then pass it to another system like if you're passing it from Python to Spark. Uh, but with Arrow, you could just put it in this one format and then put it into a location in memory somewhere and from Python, and then Spark can just consume it in the same format so you don't have that serialization, deserialization cost. Yes, that's correct. So what are the other uh, performance penalties that exist in this this data sharing ecosystem? Is it is it just that serialization, deserialization thing, or is there anything else? Well, the, the main goal of moving to columnar is to take better advantage of uh, modern CPUs, um, things like uh, better advantage of the pipelining in the CPU, of uh, the cache locality, and things like um, CMD instruction, which is a single instruction, multiple data, uh, which enables uh, working faster, that work faster when using a columnar execution scheme um, a vectorized execution, which depends on a columnar representation in memory. Is the majority of data analytics work on that's done with these big data tools like Spark, is it primarily operating on columnar data? Is like is that the ideal circumstance, or are there a lot of operations where you still do want to do operations over rows? M- most operation you'd want to do on columns. Uh, and um, a lot of those existing big data systems, they either have already partial um, vectorized execution or they moving towards it. Uh, Spark SQL, Drill, uh, Impella has been planning to move to vectorized. Um, they all uh, partially do it. The, the thing is there's some complexity to move from raw-oriented to column-oriented uh, execution because you have to flip around the way you execute things. Um, it's like a transposition of the, of the systems. Um, but this is the, the natural way things are going because it goes much faster. And maybe for people who are less familiar with this area, explain that in terms of an example. Like, what would be an operation that would be useful to... Uh, perform on columnar data, and why are why is analytics moving towards this columnar analytics fashion? So um, there there are multiple. So if we take the example of evaluating an expression, may, maybe you're doing uh, a a plus b uh, plus c divided by something, and, and you're evaluating that expression. Um, so when, when in a typical uh, volcano execution, and that's based on the volcano paper. That's one of the um, initial, you know, SQL execution um, paper that was around, um, and is more row oriented. You would take one row at a time, you know, and it would uh, go through the expression evaluation, whatever this expression is, uh, one row at a time. And uh, part of this, there are a lot of virtual calls. You know, when you you will do a a call of eval on this expression that will evaluate itself sub expressions, and this end up being uh, jumps in the in evaluation of the code, and um, and the reason I'm talking about that is because modern CPUs. Sorry, let me take a step back. <laughs> okay. I think I think I was I was thinking that the the wrong way. So let me step back. So when we evaluate an expression. We're, we're going to go through a, a bunch of code paths. And modern CPUs uh, are not executing one instruction after the other anymore. You know, initial first processors that were created were evaluating one instruction after the other. You know, it was simple. You have your program, and it's just going to execute each instruction after the other. After a while, um, there's this notion of uh, pipelining, which is an optimization that CPUs do which is starting to 
execute the next instruction before the previous one is finished. So the, each instruction is split in a pipeline of steps. And modern CPUs have like, like 12 steps or this order of magnitude. Uh, a pipeline is actually a lot of steps, like a dozen steps. And it starts executing the next one before the previous one is finished so that the overall throughput of the CPU is um, faster. And uh, in, in that mode, there, there's this trick that before, um, that the CPU will try to predict what the next instruction is. So whenever you have a, a jump in your code, which can be an if statement, which can be a loop, are a virtual function call. They all end up being jumps, uh, which are based on uh, a decision and a result of an instruction will decide what is the next instruction to execute. And so the processor will try to predict whenever there's one of those jumps, it's going to try to predict what next instruction is happening because it's trying to execute, to start executing that next instruction before it has a result of the previous one that determines which is the next, which is the result of that if, or if we're doing another loop, or if the loop is finished and we're going to the next instruction. And so be because of that, um, the columnar execution goes faster because it makes things that are very easy to predict for the processor. Encapsula is a cloud service that protects applications from attackers and improves performance. Encapsula sits between customer requests and your servers, and it filters traffic, preventing it from ever reaching your servers. Botnets and denial of service attacks are recognized by Encapsula and blocked. This protects your API servers and your microservices from responding to unwanted requests. To try Encapsula, go to encapsula.com slash SE Daily and get a month free for Software Engineering Daily listeners. Encapsula's API gives you control over the security and performance of your application. Whether you have a complex microservices architecture or a WordPress site, Encapsula has a global network of 30 data centers that optimize routing and cache your content. The same network of data centers that are filtering your content for attackers are operating as a CDN and speeding up your application. To try Encapsula today, go to Encapsula.com slash SE Daily and check it out. Thanks to Encapsula for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Like if you're a company like Spotify, for example, Spotify has all these analytics jobs that they want to run over all of their data. For example, like take all of the lengths of time that anybody listened to a song across Spotify and perform analytics and find like the average length of time that somebody spent listening to a song over the previous day. In order to perform an operation like that, all that you need would be a single column, just the column of how long did this did a person spend listening to this song. So um, I'm just trying to emphasize, give people a, a better picture for this focus on columnar data because we have all these types of analytics jobs on the back end where you don't want to have to get, you don't want to have to force your query engine or your database to look at every single user row and just pluck out the relevant column in that row. You want to be able to just say, you know what, just give me this entire column of data. Just give me this one specific aspect of the entire database table so that I can perform operations across that entire column. That's a good point. I think that one of the things that we may have uh, not entirely talked about is, is that really there's these two classes of columnar that that kind of we just say columnar and we're, we're talking about it in two different contexts, right? And so there's columnar on disk, which is a way to structure data on disk to make it efficient to pull data off of disk for analytical purposes. And then there's columnar in memory. Um, and so uh, columnar on disk, one of the really key things about that is, is this situation where you might have 100 different columns in a particular table. Um, and it's, it, I think this is exactly what you were just describing. You have 100 different columns in a table, um, but you really just want to look at um, group, uh, you know, look at sales by region. And so the, really you only need two columns, which is region and the amount of sales. And so if you're, if you're row-wise on disk 
uh, it's going to be very expensive because you're going to have to read all of the other columns, the other 98 columns, in addition to the two that you're interested in. And so columnar formats on disk have become very prevalent with Parquet sort of uh, absolutely leading the, the space there and, and Julian, um, uh, who's on the chat here, being the, the, the creator of that. Um, and so that allows you to use your disk efficiently and only pull the things out that are out that are relevant. And also when you're on disk, you have a bunch of benefits around uh, putting things that are like each other next to each other. And so you can do a lot of really advanced compression. And so then the second category is this columnar on memory stuff. Uh, columnar in memory stuff like uh, the arrow stuff where it's about again trying to make things efficient but the concerns that you have in memory are different than the concerns you have on disk and so in most cases you'll be taking columnar data off of disk moving that into memory and you'll already get to the point where you're only interacting with data that you're, is relevant to you and then from there it's about how fast can we make how efficient can we make the processing when the data is in memory and how can we make it so that we can move that data around between all the different sort of loosely coupled analytic systems that you use today uh, make that movement very very sort of uh, easy and and cheap. Okay, that was really useful because I think this might start to paint a bigger picture for people. Like you, your big data analytics uh, stack mm -hmm. probably looks like you have uh, HDFS, which is the Hadoop file system, and you're storing the file. You, you have in that file system, you have Parquet files, and Parquet is this, like you said, this format for storing columnar data on disk. Uh, and I was looking at the Parquet format. I didn't go into uh, into uh, the weeds very much when I was researching for the show, but um, it was pretty interesting. It's like, uh, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with this, Julian, and probably you too, Jacques, but it's this, this tree format, basically. You have, like, you have a nested tree where the nodes that are above the leaves, so all of the nodes that are higher than the leaves, <clears throat> describe the schema of the columns of your table and then the leaves of the tree are the actual data and this is pretty cool because it lets you just uh iterate you know through the tree until you get to the specific column that you want to access is that an accurate description uh yeah that's accurate so that's the part of the format that's based on the dremel paper mm. from google the dremel paper has uh, two main contributions uh, one is um, a distributed execution of uh, queries, and the other one is this uh, columnar representation, um, which enables uh, storing a, a nested data structure into a flat columnar representation. <clears throat> um, so the, the, the schema description supports uh, structures um, and lists, uh, which they call the repeated fields. Um, and groups and um, and the trick is is you you have a repeated structure and you want to represent that in a flat columnar representation um, so to do that um, I mean the, the general idea if you if you use a flat schema representation you can use a bit uh, a zero or one to represent whether a value is null or not so you're going to have a columnar representation when you put all the non-null values together. And then uh, next to it, you will have a bit field that will tell you um, for each value whether it's null or not. And the um, Dremel column IO representation uh, expands on that notion. Uh, so you could imagine if you have a nested data structure where you have multiple levels in your schema, instead of st storing zero or one to say whether the value is null, you will store a small integer that store at which level it's null. So when you access a field, if it's null at the first level, then you will store zero. If it's uh, null at the second level, you store one. And if it's defined, then it will be the, the depths, actually the depths of the schema, uh, which makes it that defined. So in a simple case, you know, zero means it's not defined, one means it means it's defined. And a more general case of a nested data structure, anything that is smaller than the depths of the schema means it's not defined, and it tells you at which level it's null. And the maximum value will mean that it is actually defined. Okay, so now you've given a brief overview for the Parquet storage format. 
Let's go into Arrow a little bit, and then we'll talk about pulling data from Parquet into Arrow. So Apache Arrow is this project that focuses on the columnar in-memory analytics, and you're often pulling your data from Parquet files on HDFS into uh, an Arrow um, format in memory, and then you can perform different operations on that in memory ep- representation. Whether you're performing it from uh, pandas in Spark, or if you're doing operations on, uh, I'm sorry, pandas in Python, or if you're op- performing operations on Spark using Java, you, they can all operate on this one columnar in memory analytics format. So, give us a little bit more of a picture for what the the problems that Arrow is solving for the in-memory analytics format. So the the Parquet and the Arrow nested representations are slightly different because they optimize for different trade-offs. So Parquet is more for persistence. Uh, As Jacques described earlier, um, when you query data, you usually select a subset of the columns and you want to access the columns uh, faster and make sure IO is reduced to a minimum. So you access only the columns you need, and those columns get compressed using um, data where encodings. In Euro, um, you will optimize more for CPU throughput. So the cost of IO to the main memory is much smaller uh, than the cost of IO to disk. And so here we'll optimize more towards CPU throughput. Which is why uh, in the in-memory representation in Arrow, um, we keep empty slots for null values so that we can get um, faster access by index on things. And you have other advantages like random access to data. So in Parquet, you kind of have to iterate through all the values once you selected the subset you want. And in Arrow, you can randomly access by index each individual values. Uh, in memory. Now that you've painted this picture of these two different systems and how they are optimizing for different things, what happens in the pipeline when you're pulling data off of park off of a Parquet file and pulling it into Arrow? So what, when we read from Parquet and uh, pull it into Arrow, we need to convert um, the definition level representation, which is the one I was describing earlier defined by the Dremel paper, we need to convert from those definition levels to uh, indices of where to write them, what index to write each value in memory in the arrow vector. And this can be done pretty efficiently um, as basically it's kind of converting a marker of define and define into indices. Uh, And this can be done very efficiently in a vectorized manner. And also we need to uh, decode uh, the values from the Parquet representation into uh, a more uh, bare-bone uh, CPU-efficient uh, arrow vector. And this, again, can be done very efficiently and driven by uh, what values are defined and wh- whether um, we have very few nulls or like all data is defined or there are nulls interleaved in the data. We can switch to one way or another to decode this data very efficiently into Arrow. We had a show that was entirely about Apache Arrow, but I want to give people a picture for how Arrow affects the overall ecosystem, because I get the sense that it's quite an important project because of how much the serialization, deserialization uh, challenges of interoperability between different systems slows down analytics. Maybe you could tell me if that's accurate and how Arrow affects the overall ecosystem. So maybe we can use an example for that. Okay. Um, If, for example, you have a storage layer, which is either Parquet or Kudu, um, which is a columnar uh, database, uh, open source project, um, um, they, they both have a columnar representation on disk. And then when you query that data, and, and they both support um, projection pushdowns, which is selecting only a subset of the columns, and predicate pushdowns, which is pushing the filter down to the storage layer. Um, and they, they both are able to pre-process the data to reduce how much you read uh, from disk, right? And do as much as you can in the storage layer before you push it to the engine. 
which is going to evaluate the query, evaluate expressions, and so on. And they both can do that, but um, they will each provide an API and a certain representation. And the default API is a row-oriented one because most of the existing systems, whether you do a plain Spark jobs or Pig job or uh, things like Hive, uh, natively, they were row-oriented, right? If you write a cascading job or Spark job, uh, which um, are the typical tools for doing distributed uh, processing, they all, by default, or Pig, they all use a row-oriented API. So those default APIs are row-oriented. But if you use an, a vectorized execution engine, like uh, Spark SQL is starting to do, like Drill, Apache Drill is doing, then you end up reading from a columnar representation, converting into a raw-oriented representation for interoperability, and then converting back to a columnar in-memory representation for fast vectorized execution. So there, there's a lot going on when, when each system is actually columnar, uh, having error in the middle means that when the storage layer like Kudu or Parquet read the data into error directly, they produce directly the, <clears throat> the working representation for the execution engine and it's going to be much faster to send it over and process it. So it will skip totally conversion from the columnar to oriented and then from oriented back to columnar you, we remove totally this overhead and have a much faster uh, execution when each storage layer can produce columnar data in arrow and use that directly um, for the execution engine to process. Is this what you call arrow-based storage interchange? Exactly. Okay. So that the arrow-based uh, storage inter interchange, and so things like Kudu, Parquet, can use it, and you can use it also for uh, data caching uh, di directly in a fast, um, in the format that it's used for processing. So, so one of the things we've seen, um, and so this kind of came out of this. This is a classic case of a good place for uh, people to uh, collaborate in open source. Is is that we saw people interacting with these different systems, and if you want to read Parquet or uh, some of these other technologies. The traditional way is, is that each of the systems builds its own sort of driver library, some way to connect to that source. Um, but what happens is, is that when you don't want to do as high a speed processing as possible, people start to have to build their own custom interfaces into this type, these different types of storage to get the highest level of performance. And the reason is, at the end of the day, is, is that most of these systems expose a row-level API, which is kind of sucking through a straw, if you will. Um, and so uh, the, one of the opportunities with Arrow is, is that um, rather than everybody having to write their own way to integrate with all these different technologies, um, that there's actually a common format which is high enough performance that they don't need to write custom code to interact with all these lower level things. And so we're actually seeing this start to happen, which is, is that um, we saw activity for uh, the Parquet community to build an arrow reader, which reads from Parquet into the arrow representation. And now the Pandas community is using that to expose and is working on integration to expose Pandas, uh, arrow structures to Pandas and by uh, transitivity, also Parquet access for Pandas. We're talking about a overall model where you've got much of your data stored on disk in Parquet or Kudu, and you pull that data from disk into memory. There are also these other systems that are uh, basically, say, the future is everything's in memory. Like, uh, I've done a show about Aluxio, which is uh, basically just everything is in memory. Um is that is that could you could you do that with arrow like just use put everything in memory or have, have either of you looked at the alexio system or another entirely in memory system absolutely we we've we've talked with the alexio guys a number of times about what are the sort of opportunities to 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 allow arrow and alexio to to work very well together. So they're very sort of complementary approaches. So Alexio provides this sort of in-memory grid at the file system API layer, um, which is very powerful. It's a very common interface. 
Um, and so people know how to write to it and use it very sort of efficiently. Um, but it's, it, 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 it's the same situation, which is, is that the on-disk representation is not necessarily the best representation to do fast processing. And so um, Arrow is this, is this sort of modern API specifically for how to move data around when, it's, it's, it's per when the purpose is, is doing analytical processing. And so um, absolutely you could cache huge amounts of data in memory in an error representation and then allow people to interact with that with different systems. And it's actually one of the exciting opportunities that we see with Arrow is, is the ability to um, use a data set across multiple systems. So the thing to keep in mind, right, is, is that so if you have a, uh, an on-disk representation, generally speaking, you're going to have to transform the data before you can process it. That transformation is is can be you know inexpensive to expensive depending on the representation on disk. So JSON is more expensive than say Parquet, for example. Um, and when you do that transformation, you then have to hold the data in memory uh, in that transformed version. If you maintain uh, your data in memory in an error representation, that is data that is ready to be processed as is, and that allows you to actually. Uh, and one of the things we're working on is a, is a on uh, on system and across system using things like RDMA, the ability to do sort of shared memory processing. And so what we see with most organizations is uh, a set of hot data sets that are critical to the organization. And if you want to work with that today, uh, you actually hit this challenge, which is uh, you either have a situation where um, you have to keep a lowest common denominator version of the data in memory. Um, uh, and so like say a disk based representation, um, or you have to keep multiple copies in memory that are more efficient for processing um, because each system has its own representation. And so uh, if you have the common representation in memory, it still means that each system needs to do its own transformation and actually use more memory to hold the alternative representation when it's actually doing its processing. And so with a common representation that it can be also in shared memory, that actually allows each of the tools to actually do their processing directly on the stuff that you're holding. And so what your opportunity is, is that if you today, you know, use, uh, you know, uh, Spark and uh, Pandas and, uh, you know, technologies X, Y, and Z to do processing on a cluster, you're actually typically going to probably hold uh, if you're using, for example, Alexio, you might hold the uh, disk representation in memory. You then, when you, each of those things are going to be doing processing, you may want to hold the representation of their, their internal representation in memory. And what happens is, is you actually get into the situation where you're paying for the memory many, many times. And so many customers that we work with today, they can't, uh, it's not realistic for them to hold most of their hot data sets in memory. They can hold a few of them in memory, but not lots of them. Um, but the problem is sort of compounded by the fact that different tools have to have their own in-memory representation, which means that you actually may be paying five times to hold the data in memory to satisfy all the different users of that data. And so there's actually this huge opportunity with Arrow, which is uh, if you can have a shared in-memory representation, which is available via um, IPC to the different tools, then you can actually hold substantially larger data sets in memory with the same hardware that you're using today. Saji is an end-to-end -end data platform that lets you focus on deriving business value from data. With Saji Present, you can turn your data into a story easily sharing a presentation from your data lake. Explore data and drill down into details, creating rich visualizations. With Saji Manager, you can easily build data pipelines of jobs mixing Spark, R, Python, and more. Saji is great for predictive analytics, whether you're predicting the failure of a machine in your factory or predicting which sales leads will be the most valuable. Saji helps you take control of your wide variety of data sources and gets them in one place. Check it out at Saji.com, S-A-A-G-I-E.com. Thanks to Saji for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. So if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is even in the Alexio world where you have replaced your file system with a memory-based file system, the file format is still something like Parquet or... Kudu, but it's more like just lower down in your in-memory hierarchy because you have to do a conversion from Parquet to Arrow and 
you will only do that for your hot data sets and then for your less hot data sets you might just keep them in the parquet format in memory yeah so the the trade-offs of accessing data on disk or in main memory or on um, solid state drives uh, the latency is different and so the trade-offs of uh, the time you spend spent in retrieving the data versus the time you spent decoding the data um, the trade-offs will be different. And so you will pick a different representation depending on um, all of those um, variables. Uh, and yeah. Is is there a, a richer uh, hierarchy, that, like cache hierarchy that we can talk about here? Because we're talking about in somewhat binary terms, like you've got this, the, you know, these data sets that you don't really care about right now that are in parquet. And then you've got these data sets that are, are operationally relevant right now that are in Arrow. Presumably, there is a gradient between those two things. So maybe you could paint me more of a picture for how that gradient exists. Yeah, so it used to be that you know it was either on disk or in memory, right? And you would have in-memory cache or you would uh, spill to disk data if it didn't fit in memory or things like that. Now, this, is, this um, split is becoming... There's a larger gradient of um, options uh, that are starting to appear. So first, now disks are either spinning disks that have a um, longer latency on getting to a piece of data and then higher throughput in uh, accessing this continuous stream of data. And you have solid state drive that are lower latency to get to something. Um, and it's going also in memory with non-volatile memory. Um, so NVMe is basically using flash memory in uh, in the, the sockets that accept DIM uh, main memory RAM. And so the the main reason this gives a spectrum of different latencies of like spinning disk as a higher latency, and then flash drives are faster, and then non-volatile memory is faster, and then main memory is the fastest, but most expensive. So you have a gradient of cost of storage versus uh, latency of accessing the data. And so you already have these four levels that are starting to appear, and um, the trade-off will be different in the representation of the data. You will use different trade-off on how much time it takes to suck the data through, so you will want better compression and more uh, dense encodings versus something that will be faster to process. Um, like uh, So Arrow is more at the in-memory end of the spectrum when Parquet is more at the on-disk end of the spectrum. And you have different trade-off from one to the other of when you use one or the other to, for, to getting the best performance, whether IO is your uh, bottleneck or CPU throughput is your bottleneck. To that point, the other thing I'd note there is, is that 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 spectrum we expect that that will become more and more uh, rich. In that arrow is the place where we're focused on the in-memory representation, and we're starting with the representation, which is, uh, or are we starting with a representation that's uh, very useful for a lot of different situations. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's highly efficient for processing. It, it's reasonably compact. Um, but there's actually alternative memory representations that can be beneficial for certain kinds of data, right? And so we have some options actually already, sort of some capabilities already inside of Arrow to support sort of a sparse versus a dense representation for certain types of uh, sort of sub data structures. Um, but what we expect to see happen is, is we actually have a specification already for dictionary encoding in the context of Arrow. And so what we expect to see is, is that that whole spectrum of representation, it's not going to be parquet or arrow, it's going to be several different representations and potentially data sets where portions of the data set, you might say, hey, I'm going to maintain these six columns in a arrow dictionary representation, these four columns in an arrow uh, sparse representation, and these 12 columns in a parquet representation in memory, and these 25 parquet columns in a parquet representation on disk. Right, so the representation and the lo the, the the location of the of the data, what sort of media, um, will both be configured based on the requirements of that data in relationship to your workload. You two both work at Dremio. I interviewed your CEO Tomer, I think, a 
uh, yeah, last year. And we talked mostly about Drill in that conversation. And um, I think at that time, Dremio was, uh, I know Dremio is still in stealth, and we don't need to talk much about Dremio today. I'm sure that when Dremio is uh, on the market, I think you're in beta right now. I'm sure when, when, when Dremio is on the market, we'll do a show about it. I'm, I'm sure I would love to at least. Um, but I'm curious about what you can talk about in terms of why the conversation um, around the Dremio product has shifted from being focused on drill to a focus on arrow. Well, I think it's it's all about the sort of uh, loose coupling, right? So um, uh, we have people here who are involved in a variety of different open source Apache projects, and we we make a lot of contributions there and care very much about uh, about doing so. Um, the, 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 what we, what we've recognized or what, what we see as sort of the interesting sort of direction we're going is, is that we are moving from a situation where, uh, we have monolithic systems, right? Like you think of Oracle as the sort of very traditional sort of monolithic data system where everything has to happen inside of Oracle to what is a very, very loosely coupled analytics ecosystem, right? Where it's not one tool I'm using, it's it's 12 that I'm combining together and it's best to breed for the particular use case I have. So today it might be Spark and tomorrow it might be Drill and the next day it might be Impala that solves a particular use case very, very well. And so what open source has been especially good at uh, is uh, building the um, the common components that connect those things. And so that's really where we focus a lot of our time. And so uh, Parquet is an example of a common component that's used in many, many technologies. We're working on Arrow being incorporated into a number of these technologies as well as a common component. Uh, we're also involved in a project called Apache Calcite, which is a process, a, a query optimization framework used in a bunch of different projects. And so really where Dremio is focusing a lot of its time is on uh, contributing to these common components to make a better version, a, a better, to improve the ability for people to operate in this loosely coupled ecosystem. Because we all know that loosely coupled can be very powerful, but it can also be very challenging, especially if you start to say, hey, well, I can use these tools together, but all of a sudden it's very, very expensive to use them together. And so what we're really driving towards is this, how do we make it so that the we sort of uh, help to better achieve the promise of loosely coupled um, while reducing the pain of loosely coupled. I was interviewing Tomas Tungus, who works at Redpoint, and we had a slight conversation about Dremio because he worked on the investment uh, from Redpoint in Dremio, and we were talking about you know like um, other technologies, uh, and we were talking about GraphQL. And I don't know if you know about GraphQL or um, a similar project from Netflix called Falcor, but these are projects where it's also working on this data interoperability problem. It's except it's kind of at a different layer of the stack. Like it's more at the the uh, request response stack. Like if I'm a user logging on to Facebook, Facebook has to fetch all this data from disparate data sources. And they've got a bunch of databases, and they're going to pull like the likes from one database, the photos from one database, the news articles from one database. It's such a mess of different things, but you can represent all those requests in one big blob of a JSON-like structure that is called graph, like GraphQL structure. And then that request uh, hits a GraphQL server, and it gets federated to all these different databases. Um, and when I, th- you know, we had a brief conversation about that, and the more I thought about it, I was like, well. Um, you know, right now we have this, uh, this paradigm where there's kind of this idea of like offline data and online data. There's like the offline data that's, um, stuff that your Hadoop, um, or Spark or whatever is going to be accessing. And then you have the, the online data, which is like, I log on to Facebook and it fetches my photos and stuff and it's easily accessible. But that is like a kind of a false dichotomy because you can imagine a situation where over time, you know, your request to a GraphQL server gets federated to systems that could just access arrow data structures, and then it's in memory, and then it's fast, and then it's like, oh my gosh, that's a world of possibility, because if you take all the offline data and basically make it online data that's accessible to users, I mean, that that's a big shift. Yeah, no, absolutely. Although I would I'd say that one of the, 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 there's two sort of... Um... Uh, there's probably a two by two on this, which is is that there is the concept of offline data and online data, and I think that anybody who's worked in this space 
those two rule those two worlds get very blurred very very quickly and then I think there's a separate s sort of set of things to look at which is um, uh, analytical purpose versus what I would describe as more oper or operational purpose right so people have the need for example to respond to a user request and give them the right information for that request right uh, which is what I would describe as a very operational thing I need to uh, tell you uh, you know uh, how many likes this post has or I need to, you know, you know, share this message with you from your friend or whatever. Um, and it's a very operational purpose. You're dealing with small amounts of data uh, on each individual sort of transaction, if you will. Um, uh, but you have a large quantity of these types of operations, right? I've got a hundred billion or a billion users who are hitting the servers all the time, right? And then you've got a second sort of scenario, which is a lower quantity of interactions of data, but typically on a wider breadth of data. Uh, so that would I call it an analytical purpose, where I might be wanting to, uh, you know, understand how customers are working in, or how, how my users are using a particular feature. And I want to understand which ones, you know, give up on using this, the feature versus those that like to use it a lot and how long do they spend using it. And so that's a sort of an analytical purpose. And so I think that what, what's, what, what's happening is, is kind of, uh, you're seeing the uh, traditionally, it's been kind of very much like analytical is offline and operational is online. It's kind of like the way that that sort of chart sort of was laid out. Um, but I think that you're absolutely right, which is that these lines are getting blurred. And so uh, one analytical, like, you know, uh, you know, using streaming systems to be able to do what is effectively sort of uh, very short term or very sort of present time uh, analytical uh, work uh, is very, very common now. Um, and these uh, operational workloads are starting to look also very analytical in their in their in their uh, sort of nature. In that you may want to not only see, hey, this message just appeared from you, but also how many other people uh, are uh, you know uh, excited about this or have, or have interacted with this message, which is a little bit more of an analytical type of uh, of, of metric. And so I think that you you do see this sort of vision where these things are coming closer and closer together and having common ways to interact with them uh, is very uh, powerful. That being said, I think that one of the things that I still see a lot is, is a split in the types of users for each of these things. And you've got what are, I would say, more frequently developers who are doing operational types of uses, whereas you see uh, sort of more analysts, business, business owners, those kinds of people who are much more interested in the analytical types of answers. So you still see some of those separation in terms of the users, but the technologies, I think, are getting very, very close together, for sure. Now, I know we're nearing the end of our time, but um, just to put things in context, uh, Jacques, you ran the distributed systems team at MapR, and Julian, you led the data analytics pipeline at Twitter in your lives before joining Dremio. So these are big companies where you have you get a lot of uh, exposure to the chat, like the kind of the biggest challenges that exist in the big data ecosystem. Um, maybe you could each give your perspective on what kinds of things you saw, uh, what challenges you were exposed to, um, whether it's related to the challenges of columnar formats or not. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go first. Um, uh, so I think that what 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 I see is a uh, an extraordinary amount of uh, technical innovation happening in, in in a lot of these places in, in data in general, right? Like what's happened in the last ten years in data has been phenomenal in terms of not only the rise of um, uh, of all of these sort of big data systems, the rise of NoSQL, the the ability for developers to be uh, you know magnitudes more agile in creation of applications than the, what they were able to do um, uh, you know 10 years ago uh, and, and part of that's the sort of democratization of data control from sort of central IT and DBAs to uh, an engineer being able to sit down spin up a Mongo instance build an application and start working on it so you get this sort of explosion of capability and that explosion of capability has I think given people huge amounts of powerful capabilities um, uh, I think it's also made developers' lives substantially better. Uh, what I've also seen, though, is, is I've seen actually a, uh, I would say, a, some level of degradation of a huge portion of the analyst workloads, uh, work, uh, work lives. And the reason is, is that you've got this data all over the place uh, in all these different systems, right? So if you think of it from an analyst perspective, you know, 
the monolithic world was kind of pretty nice and pretty friendly and pretty clean, right? So the DBA made sure all my data was nice and organized and I knew exactly where all my data was and I could get access to it. And the process for defining, defining new projects was very was you know very structured so that we always made sure before we started a project that uh, that the data that needed to be tracked for, me able, for an analyst to be able to do his job was, was done very well. And so what we've moved towards is this, this world where things are much more dynamic, much more agile, people can build things much more quickly. Um, and you get these sort of you know, business applications which, which can get into the world in you know, like one-tenth the time that they used to take. However, what's happened is, is that the analyst is kind of uh, not always thought of immediately uh, as part of that. And so they often have to deal with sort of the ramifications of uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, move fast, break things um, in the an analysis side. So I need to deal with 20 different versions of the data because we keep changing the, how the UI is, is, is storing things or how we're tracking things or whatever. And so um, what I see is I see a huge amount of technology that is trying to help this, but that technology is often uh, complicated to use and is um, uh, requires the 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 very very uh, talented resources to be able to use it, and so you, you get a lot of success of using that technology in the more sophisticated organizations. You know, like for example, a lot of the people in the in the Silicon Valley area here, uh, they have uh, you know these amazing teams that have these da amazing data engineering and data infrastructure teams, which can do all sorts of amazing things with all these technologies. But when you get into a lot of other parts of the uh, of organizations, uh, it's very hard for them to uh, find the level of talent and to be able to stitch these things together to solve real business problems. And so I think that there's a huge amount of sort of capacity and technology. Um, I think that sometimes the, the challenges are that the pieces don't work well together, that it isn't easy to get them to solve your actual business problem. And so that's really uh, sort of one of the sort of driving forces that I see in sort of what we're doing uh, at Dremio. And, you know, obviously we can talk more about this as, as we launch, but it's how do I make it so that the the that the common user, the, the, the millions of SQL analysts that are out there or the millions of people who are non-technical who are sitting there using Excel or Tableau, that they have uh, the ability to work and achieve their business goals uh, with the power of all this technology, um, uh, even without having the massive data engineering force that someone like uh, Facebook or a um, or a Uber or a Twitter can 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 staff, right? So how do we give them sort of the same sort of set of capabilities, the same sort of power that that uh, the, these 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 organizations that don't have that staff? as the people what what's what's happened here how do we how do we get that to other people in the world Julian do you want to share a little bit of your experience at Twitter uh, sure so what what I've seen in a company like Twitter and that's true of uh, many of those big web companies um, one of the harder problems is to build a ecosystem uh, for people to interact with data because pretty much the entire company every team in the company uh, interacts with data and they're not just consuming, they're consuming data, producing data, producing derived data sets, and they all start to depend on each other. And instead of like the old world of the data warehouse where you have a source of truth of all the data and people use it, uh, where there's very much a producer consumer relationship, uh, we move in a world where you have a huge graph of dependencies between different teams inside the companies and the data keeps evolving and the structure of the company keeps evolving and you need to build tools to allow uh, different teams to depend on each other reliably and there are many different aspects to this uh, it comes from data collection of knowing what's happening and then you will have a, a spam detection team that will consume data to try to figure out what is spam versus what's a real user of the system. Uh, some people will work on categorizing users so that the service can be uh, better catered to their specific needs. And they will all start using those different source of in information. And once users have been categorized, it can be used for spam detection or for relevance. And, and so you have this complex set of tools and that can be data collection, that can be scheduling, that can be uh, tools for fast interactive analysis or dashboard producing. 
And all those systems, um, you have this big living entity, of which is a company that is doing a lot of things. And one of the challenge is enabling everyone to be uh, independent and agile and do their own work while still depending on each other. Because the more you have links between teams, the more there's chance for things breaking and changing and um, and breaking everything, right? So once you build all those dependencies between all those teams, something breaking will impact a lot of people in the company. And so that's where you need to build tools that will make everything more reliable and easier to work in a decentralized manner when people can build those relationships and dependencies in a way that's going to be reliable and it can build trust and be efficient in what they're doing. All right. Well, that's a great way to close off the show. Julian and Jacques, thank you for giving me your time. This is a really interesting conversation, and I'm excited to see what develops in the world of Aero and particularly with Dremio. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it. It was good to be talking to you. Thank you. Ad for Prize is an iOS app where users can create ads to win prizes. Companies post these prizes as an incentive for people to make ads. If you're a creative person and you love to compete, you will love Ad for Prize. Check it out on the iOS App Store. Only the most creative advertisements win the prizes, like $150 cash or $100 gift certificates to your favorite retail companies. With Ad for Prize, I am trying to change the way that online advertising works, and I'm currently hiring an iOS developer to lead the engineering of Ad for Prize. If you'd like to work with me, send me an email, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com. And if you have an iOS device, check out Ad for Prize, A D F O R P R I Z E, Ad for Prize, one word. Check it out on the iOS App Store, and I hope you continue to listen to Software Engineering Daily. <laughs>